Good afternoon to everyone joining us. My name is Giulia Pavesi. I'm a researcher at the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, and it is my great pleasure to host and moderate the sixth lecture of our high-level spring lecture series on the role of the European Union in fostering a European space ecosystem. Today's lecture will focus the European Union flagship program Copernicus, analyzing its historical development, its institutional governance, its policy and legal framework, the external dimension of the program, and of course the Copernicus users ecosystem. For this lecture, it's my pleasure to ask Mr. Philippe Brunet, is the current principal advisor to the Director General DG INTPA on digital and data in charge of developing the use of science, technology and innovation for the development and to promote the digital transformation and the use of new technologies to help the policies of INTPA towards the achievement of the SDGs. In this regard, we couldn't have a better expert as Mr. Brunet has worked for almost 30 years for the European Union in various high-level positions since 1988. After having worked in the Director General on Social Affairs and Industry, he joined the cabinet of Marcos Cipriano as deputy head of cabinet in 2004, becoming head of cabinet in 2007. He then continued to serve as head of cabinet for Mrs. Andruja Vasidiu in both the first and the second Barroso Commission. In January 2013, the Commission appointed him as director for aerospace, maritime and defense industry in Digigro where its institutional tasks comprise inter alia the implementation of the youth space program Copernicus, the development of civil and military synergies in security and defense matters, as well as the design and development of the European Defense Fund. From January 2019 to January of 2021, he was then the principal advisor in DigiDefco, with the task of developing the use of new technologies and data, big data concept, including those from the youth space programs, to have the policies of DEFCO towards the achievement of the SDGs. At this point, I would like to call all the participants to submit any question that they might have to our panelists via the question box that you can find on the right side of your screen. Please do it already during the lecture so that we can select and collect all the questions. Um, they will be posed to our guest lecturer during the Q&A. And now, without further ado, I will leave the floor to Mr. Philippe Brunet. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here today and to um, explain to you my uh, one of my uh, most uh, uh, impressive, not to say stunning, uh, uh, experience in the Commission. Uh, that is to say, to be the, the director for six years of uh, something completely new, uh, which was the uh, coming into uh, full implementation of the Copernicus program. And I will uh, go with you through the different developments of the, of the program and uh, also to, to have the possibility to uh, explain beyond uh, the fact and uh, beyond what is uh, legally said in the regulation or in the different uh, legal act, uh, how was this uh, program developing in uh, areas which uh, were at the beginning uh, not clearly identified or uh, completely uh, overlooked. I would like uh, to say that um, uh, Copernicus and the other space program, Galileo, uh, at that time, and I will refer to the period of uh, first implementation of uh, Copernicus, that means from uh, 2013 to uh, 2020. Uh, um, Galileo and Copernicus uh, were actually uh, industrial projects. There are three industrial projects developed by the EU Commission, by the EU. The third one being ITER which is the uh, program uh, in order to to try to uh, to control the new uh, energy uh, through the uh, fusion uh, atomic fusion um, and uh, in my career obviously um, i uh, i have never been before January uh, 
expertise, uh, a project manager of an industrial project. That is very important because um, this project would not only have a huge consequences uh, in terms of, because that's the raison d'etre of uh, Earth observation uh, made in a totally different way than Earth observation used to be in the past and still is done in certain other uh, country or, uh, or in certain areas, but also uh, it will have had a tremendous uh, implication uh, in uh, different uh, domain, uh, like uh, I would say, uh, for instance, uh, industrial policy. Uh, and by that, I mean, for instance, uh, the search of uh, innovative uh, technology for Earth observation uh, to help the development of the EU uh, launchers in order to, to reach, which is still a goal uh, for the EU to have uh, autonomous access to space, uh, because with Copernicus, of course, we procure uh, rockets and uh, we have become, together with Galileo, the main uh, public customers of uh, the, the launch uh, industry in Europe. We have also served as anchor customers for the development of new technologies, for instance, uh, technology based on la laser in order for the different satellites to uh, uh, communicate between uh, each other. And I refer to uh, DRS, which is still uh, in place on certain of our satellites. And uh, also, we have had a very important effect on the development of um, uh, digitalization in Europe. Very rapidly, we have become the main provider of data in Europe due to the to all the data uh, from taken from the remote uh, sensing, sensing uh, and also from the from the satellites from the satellites but also from uh, uh, data acquired uh, on the ground um, through uh, terrestrial sensors this means that we have had a huge effect on uh, the development of uh, what is still to be done uh, to have a, a concrete uh, cloud. Uh, Copernicus has also led uh, to the development of um, the algorithm industry. And you will see in the course of my presentation that uh, nearly all the activities, the economic activities, where uh, you, you need to have the information. Uh, uh, about uh, Earth and certain conditions have uh, switched totally the way they were uh, planning and they were functioning before to incorporate Earth observation data and then use the uh, Copernicus data. Uh, and finally, I think that uh, you will see also during the presentation that um, we have had uh, not only hard legal basis, starting with uh, uh, the Article 189 uh, of the treaty, which is the legal basis of uh, the Copernicus regulation, which was the legal basis of the Copernicus regulation, and which is still the legal basis of the new space regulation. Uh, but also, we have been uh, obliged to adopt uh, implementation regulations, in particular for data. I will uh, have a word about that. But we have developed a whole uh, toolbox of uh, different uh, legal instruments, from hard to soft, uh, which, was, which were not foreseen as such at the very beginning of uh, 
the implementing period of Copernicus, that means in 2013, but which were which appeared to be absolutely uh, indispensable. Uh, MOU, the Moradom of Understanding, uh, uh, very specific procurement um, uh, processes, uh, delegation act to certain uh, third uh, entities, uh, administrative arrangement between uh, EU and uh, third countries, uh, and also uh, to have some, uh, I would call that uh, de facto agreement with some part of the industry in order to help us to, to, to achieve the goal. This means that uh, uh, very often one policy is linked to one type of instruments at the EU level, and you know that at the EU level, either you have uh, legal basis and uh, legislation, uh, or you have money. Uh, that's the preconditions to be effective and to be recognized as uh, uh, having uh, a real effect. Uh, in the case of Copernicus, we had both and we forge additional ones and uh, i think that it's very important uh, the copernicus which started uh, described in the regulation in 2013 uh, was not is not copernicus right now that means that it's a, a tree which has been blossoming and which has produced uh, effect in a lot of uh, directions which were not uh, uh, foreseen in the regulation, not even uh, uh, not even uh, thought as being uh, possible. Uh, finally, and then I will start the presentation. I would like to say that uh, if I'm starting with Galileo uh, as a comparison, um, we have avoided in uh, Copernicus. Uh, what has been the problem of Galileo at the beginning, this means to choose the kind of governance which could uh, uh, be uh, the matching uh, at the best the necessity, the needs of, uh, of, of the program. You may remember that um, uh, Galileo at the very beginning was given uh, through a, a joint undertaking uh, in uh, one of the framework program and given through a private, public private partnership to the industry. That does not, that did not uh, work. So in two, uh, 207, that was cancelled. And uh, afterwards, it was uh, decided uh, to have a framework agreement with the European Space Agency in order to and with uh, to, to and with Emetsat in order to to develop the space programs, and uh, that means that uh, since the beginning, uh, when uh, after the development phases, uh, when the question of the governance of Copernicus uh, was uh, put on the table, uh, and that was to have a clear idea about the governance was obviously one of the prerequisites for the parliament to give us money, we went directly to a mode of uh, cooperation between the EU and, uh, in particular, my directorate, and uh, the European Space Agency uh, in order to uh, have an apportionment of tasks between uh, uh, both of us and to uh, uh, put uh, ESA as the technical project manager and the commission as the overall project manager. So uh, this is important because uh, uh, we did not uh, go through the uh, you know everlasting discussion where uh, through uh, where to place uh, the industry, where to place uh, the intergovernmental. Uh, uh, area, in particular ESA, which is an intergovernmental organization, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the EU, because the legal framework 
of both organizations where the where the two organizations are um, uh, working uh, are different uh, and uh, uh, on the top of that uh, we uh, we have had uh, since the beginning uh, the lessons uh, drawn from Galileo also in uh, the way uh, in order to teach us the way to shape the relationship between uh, ESA, the National Space Agency, other uh, partners uh, which were already through the development phase of Galileo involved in the initial operation. That means that at the beginning, everybody knew more or less due to the hiccups uh, uh, faced by Galileo uh, where the how, how to organize the governance and where the different actors should uh, should uh, should intervene. So, Copernicus was uh, is the EU Earth Observation Program. It's a EU space program, but not only because beyond the space program, which is uh, basically uh, the source of the raw data we need afterwards to uh, analyze to process the data to couple them with data coming from outside the program of copernicus in order to meet the user needs and delivering to the users the product they are requested requesting for uh, driving for conducting their policies so it's a user-driven program. At the beginning, users was meant to be public uh, authorities, government, national, regional, the EU, the Commission, the different uh, uh, DG, the Commission, the, the external action service, and so on and so forth. But very rapidly, uh, the users appeared to be in the vast majority private companies and hence the development of the ecosystem around Copernicus where they could find free of charge and fully open to them all the data and the products and information produced by the service to develop their own business. So from the beginning public user we have ended up with a community of users uh, encompassing, of course, the public sector, but very importantly, the private one. And it's this private one, which of course can produce growth and job. Uh, today is the first Earth observation system uh, in the world. And uh, for for that, uh, maybe two things uh, are uh, worth remembering. Uh, first, at the beginning of uh, the general oper the initial operation of Copernicus, uh, Europe was uh, relying on Andysat, and uh, which was uh, a satellite. Uh, that uh, built the old way, which means that in one satellite, you have all the different type of sensors. So it's a monster, and, uh, and, this, and this sat has had a very short life, even though it's still orbiting, uh, and nobody knows when it will uh, come down, uh, uh, because and this sat uh, failed, you know, and, uh, the EU was deprived of any comprehensive, and this was then uh, in an entire governmental way by the European Space Agency. And after the failure of the Andesat mission, of course, EU had no proper Earth observation mission. And undoubtedly, the fact that Andesat disappeared, at least the, it did not work anymore, has uh, given a boost of Copernicus. Another lesson 
which was important after Anvinsat, and that has been because Anvinsat was copying, for instance, the satellite of of the USA. Uh, Europe decided not only to uh, go beyond the characteristic and the potential of Anvinsat due to the new technology arriving, but also not to go for one satellite. Uh, covering all the different uh, possibility of observation, but a fleet of several satellites, which could be displayed uh, along a certain uh, time frame, uh, that would allow first to, uh, as there are the first one and the recurrent satellites, to benefit from incremental uh, uh, innovation, and uh, for certain type of sensors, uh, by launching a recurrent satellite of a certain category, having certain specificity enhanced vis-a-vis -vis the previous uh, copy of the satellite. Obviously, that's not possible in a, uh, in a, in a satellite uh, uh, like uh, Anvisat, because you cannot uh, modify uh, during the life of the satellite, uh, any sensors, uh, even though some could uh, be uh, more or less uh, updated uh, after five, uh, five years. So that has uh, uh, allowed first for each sensor to be more precise, and uh, secondly, to have a fleet of satellites which could follow and uh, improve itself due to the different incremental or uh, incremental innovation or real innovation. Uh, the number, for instance, we have currently two satellites, Sentinel-1. The current Sentinel-1, the, the recurrent Sentinel-1 uh, satellite, the, we have the AB flying. The CAD will have additional features which will remain within the, uh, within the satellites, but uh, uh, with different uh, different um, uh, characteristic and uh, with uh, increased uh, potential. So I will uh, go maybe back to Stefano uh, the um, the story of Copernicus. Uh, Copernicus is a long uh, as a long story. He started. Uh, in 1988, with the Baveno uh, Manifesto, which was uh, a manifesto describing, due to the advance of technology in Earth observation, uh, due to digitalization, uh, due also to the fact that um, there was uh, new challenges both in security, but also uh, in terms of uh, uh, climate change, uh, also the, the, the fact that uh, uh, metrology uh, was not enough to, uh, to uh, explain and to follow uh, climatic, uh, climatic event, meteorological event. Uh, that was a plea to develop a kind of strategic autonomy for Europe in order to be able to uh, have its own source of EU uh, observation, uh, of, uh, yes, uh, Earth observation, uh, with a view of um, uh, the environment, the protection of the environment, and uh, security. Uh, then, after the Baveno summit, which was a, a plea, a request, uh, the Göteborg EU summit has uh, decided to launch uh, uh, Copernicus. And I was referring to, uh, by the way, Andisat. Uh, um, uh, Andisat at the time was still uh, was still working. Okay, but. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, the level of uh, ambition was still 
to be uh, uh, reinforced and uh, the, the ambitions should be uh, as regards implementations should, uh, should be still uh, refined and it's really in uh, in 2005 that uh, uh, the EU decided to go for a flagship uh, project. Uh, Galileo existed at that time. Uh, the problem of Galileo at that time uh, were still not solved because it's in 2007 that uh, we decided to go from a public private partnership to a role where the Commission will ensure the project management. And so uh, after this uh, date, uh, through the different, uh, because that was the development the, the, of, of Copernicus, with the money coming predominantly from the six and the seven work um, uh, framework program for research, we decided to put in place the architecture of Copernicus. That means to have our own source of remote sensing, the satellites, to have also the possibility to get data from other systems and also to develop the different services. And the different services, of course, uh, needed at, uh, to be clearly defined to uh, respond to the user needs. So uh, little by little, everything put were put together, and we arrived in uh, 2011, where the different services, which were most of them still uh, in development and financed by the research fund, uh, were uh, clearly identified, and. Uh, they were given some terms of reference in order to explain what they, they would produce and for for whom. But at that time, that it was decided to have uh, six services, the five services, services that I will explain to you later. On. So the the initial operation started in 2011, but at that time there was no satellites flying. That means that the services were processing or reprocessing data coming from other sources, other satellites, namely the satellites launched by the different uh, member states. Um, during the negotiation of uh, uh, the MFF, the multiannual the multi framework, the financial uh, framework, uh, uh, the Commission for 2013 till 2020. Uh, the Commission did not foresee any uh, money because at that time, uh, for reasons to be honest, that uh, I've never clearly understood. Uh, I think it was more a question of uh, uh, trying to balance more the EU budget. Anyway, they were trying to uh, get the financing of Copernicus through a kind of funds, uh, intergovernmental funds, uh, a bit like the European Development Funds for the for cooperation was uh, was, uh, was 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 set. The Parliament uh, refused and reinstalled Copernicus in the EU budget directly with uh, an amount nearly four billion, exactly three. 0.8 uh, uh, billion. Um, I think that was absolutely uh, a great uh, uh, novelty because, as uh, Copernic, as Galileo, uh, the Commission, through the budget uh, stemming from the general budget of uh, the EU, uh, really. Uh, Got a grasp on the development of the problem, of the of the of the problem. Um, next slide. So I was telling you uh, that uh, basically there is a kind of uh, value chain 
logical chain, industrial, technological chain, whatever, many chains. Uh, we got the uh, how Copernicus works is because there are several components and each of the components are regulated and are part of the overall project and that and thus submitted to the decision of the project managers. So we have the Sentinel and the contributing mission, the Sentinel, the fleet of the Copernicus satellites. The contributing mission, we continue to get data from national uh, satellites as we did during the pre-operational phase. And we have also terrestrial sensors, in situ sensors, which uh, uh, are aggregated with the, uh, the spatial data in order to cover uh, in the best possible way all the different, uh, uh, I would say, uh, source of uh, sources of information uh, in which are useful to uh, produce the information which are needed. Uh, both sources so are put in uh, uh, computers and uh, out of that, uh, different services uh, from uh, land to ocean to atmosphere, climate change, uh, also service for uh, emergency si situation, uh, are uh, processing, reprocessing the data to transform them into a uh, product and, sorry, into information. And uh, uh, this information, this information is finally uh, modified in a tailor-made process in order to have the product. So I will give you an example. I'm uh, always the same. I'm taking always the same. Someone has already uh, uh, hear me about that, you will think that um, I'm rather consistent, at least on that. Uh, uh, I'm coming from Bordeaux, people are surfing, okay? So they need to have a lot of uh, information about the wind, the level of the sea, the, the tides, uh, and so on and so forth. That are the products they need, okay? So uh, if I go through this different chain, the different sensors through the services which could provide the information will tell you about the tide, about the salinity, about the current, about the meteorology, about uh, the, I don't know, the, the, the possibility to have, uh, also to have uh, uh, pollution or not, uh, and it's tailored by certain startup, for instance, which will end up with an app, and the app will give you the product. In the case of surfing, I give you this example because that exists. From Copernicus, you can tell the surfer, don't go in this part of the beach, because all the conditions are met that you may, that you will find jellyfish. So from the satellite to the salinity, the current that has information, you modify that through a computer, you reprocess, and you tell that the product, there are jellyfish. Or, for instance, there are uh, an unknown current or a strong current uh, which uh, is not normally present, but which will be present uh, this day. And that, at the beginning, is just a series of zero and one, 
because all the data coming from the sentinels or from the in-situ sensors are digital. So from one and zero, you end up saying that don't go to Lakanovich because you will have GDFs. So for the sentinel, there are seven uh, sentinel uh, in orbit to date. Uh, Sentinel 1A and B, which is the one of the most uh, characteristic of um, uh, of uh, Copernicus, because it's a radar Sentinel. Most of the radar uh, satellites are of uh, are for military. They have a very uh, narrow swath. Uh, that means that, for instance, uh, if you want to see uh, something, if you have a, a swath, that means the, the, the portion of uh, of land that the sentinel thought that the, the radar is uh, is um, uh, looking at, uh, it's something about one or two kilometers. Okay, with sentinel. Uh, sometimes even less. It's very precise, but the swath is very, very short. Uh, Sentinel is 300 kilometers, Sentinel-1. That means that you can have a whole country seen in two different, uh, in two different uh, uh, area, in two different uh, revolution of the satellite. Uh, and it's particularly uh, important when you are in the, uh, under, uh, for instance, uh, a hurricane or uh, a, a typhoon. Uh, then Sentinel-2 and 3 are uh, optical, optical uh, uh, satellites. Uh, and uh, one in particular, Sentinel-3, is an altimeter. It will it's help to, to uh, determine the level of the ocean. Or ocean. Um, Sentinel uh, 5P uh, is uh, for precursor, is uh, uh, dealing with the atmosphere, and uh, Sentinel uh, 6 uh, will fly also with uh, Sentinel uh, 4 and uh, for, uh, sorry, Sentinel 3 for altimetry, that means the level of the ocean. Next slide. So the contributing mission will be very short. That uh, we are adding to the uh, different data which are provided by uh, the specific uh, Copernicus sensors, the Sentinel or the Institute. <coughs> uh, they are complemented by the different uh, 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 the data obtained by uh, the member states through their own uh, satellites. You, you will see that on the on the slide. The point is that it's absolutely a complementarity and not something which is uh, a competition. Now the governance. I told you that uh, we uh, had uh, since the beginning. Uh, um, the possibility to uh, uh, run the program through a rather traditional uh, way uh, for this kind of program because it was uh, more or less already um, in place for Galileo after the modification of the governance. So the commission is assisted by a program committee where on a, a yearly basis we propose a work program to be developed during the budgetary years and the program committee votes by qualified majority in order to determine uh, our policy for the kind of data and the kind of product and also uh, upstream the kind of um, uh, sensors we should have uh, we have a user forum, which is a consultative uh, body 
and which aggregates the different possibilities uh, or the different needs of uh, the community of users. Can I have the again the slides on the governance? Stefano, can I have the, yes, the governance. I think there is some connection issue. Then uh, we have delegated to uh, ESA the management of the space components. That's through a delegation agreement uh, for uh, the majority of the satellites. There are some satellites uh, which are not uh, only for uh, Copernicus, and we have been able to put some sensors on satellites which are meteorological satellites. That's why UMETSAT uh, is also uh, linked to the governance of Copernicus through uh, a delegation uh, agreement. Then we have uh, also uh, to uh, incorporate in the governance, the running of the different uh, services. And here we have the so-called delegated uh, entity. Uh, there are six uh, from one service of the commission, which is the Joint Research Center, to uh, uh, an agency of the, of the council, which is uh, um, the uh, satellite center of, of the EU, but also some uh, EU agency like uh, the European Environment Agency for, for the land, Frontex for the security service, and, and SAF for security and uh, maritime service. Next slide. Which is particularly important to stress is that since the beginning we have uh, advocate we have been advocating for a full free and open access policy for five out of the six services the security service of course contains certain elements which are useful for the psc uh, uh, and also for for the migration uh, so this uh, service uh, is not public but the the, the five other services uh, land uh, marine um, atmosphere uh, climate change and uh, emergency situation uh, are giving for free the raw data and the product this is absolutely important to give the raw data because the product is, is already the result of the processing uh, uh, of uh, the raw data. If we give the final product, we cannot go, you cannot go back to the raw data and reprocess the way you want, sometimes different from the way they have been processed for uh, achieving the product. This means that it's an enormous, economic tool because giving the raw data and the product you can use directly the product but if you don't find uh, what you are looking for in the product or the process because you have access to the raw data you can through your private your own algorithm your own processing methods reprocess the data in order to achieve different product uh, the, the only point uh, the only point of course uh, is that uh, certain data from the contributing mission are protected and uh, these data from the contributing mission are not necessarily if the member states contributing uh, oppose or the company oppose uh, are not given for free uh, by the way there, there is a budget in copernicus to buy them 
but in the fact by them it's for the use of Copernicus, not to, for the use of others. But all the genuine data produced by the Sentinels are uh, open, free, and full in in, in access. Next slide. Once uh, we have uh, started to see that there was a kind of overlap of the results of Copernicus in some other uh, domain, like for instance, uh, technological development induced by the fact that we were trying to uh, get additional data in a different way. So there was a push toward the industry to develop innovative solution or innovative product. Uh, we, uh, we saw also the economic effect on the society uh, due to the uh, policy on data uh, boosting uh, startup and so on and so forth. We decided to have a kind of a paper encompassing both uh, program Galileo and Copernicus and defining the a new EU space strategy much more centered not only on the development of the space industry and the development of a system uh, in order to match the user needs of uh, each uh, space program but also uh, pointing out the value of this program outside their limits in order to see the benefits for the EU society and for the EU economy through growth and jobs. That at this moment, that if I remember well, we were in a ratio where nearly one euro uh, invested through the budget to the Copernicus program uh, were producing uh, and but in, in in a different way according to uh, to the to the field or, or, or the domain studied up to four of seven times the investment so one to four one one to seven and that is extremely important because not only we were serving we were boosting and developing the space industry, the space uh, at large, uh, from launcher to satellite industry to uh, application, but also we were benefiting the society in order to help the creation of new jobs, mainly through specific application. Next slide. So uh, I was talking about uh, the different uh, delegated uh, uh, act. First, with EDA. Uh, EDA was the, it still is, the project uh, uh, manager from the uh, space component. Okay. So we delegated some competences in order to coordinate the space component, to do the procurement of the satellites and the procurement of other uh, uh, of uh, other um, features which were uh, important for the for, for the program, uh, to uh, follow, of course, uh, the operations, and to uh, coordinate the access to the contributing mission, that means to, to, to buy and to, to build up a kind of a warehouse of data for the benefit of Copernicus, because ESA was in a position to know what were the different data in the member states from the national programs, which could be useful for, uh, for, for Copernicus. Uh, for that, we put in place something which is quite interesting, the procurement board. Because uh, as we were paying, uh, we, were, we, wanted, we wanted to have the possibility 
to check and to interfere if, politically speak, if the different development of ESA and the way they were procuring the different, uh, the different um, uh, lots of, uh, of, of work at, in, in the different uh, industry uh, were compatible with uh, our goal for the program itself and uh, the goal for the development of, uh, of uh, for instance, uh, space, um, uh, autonomous space uh, access or uh, was uh, in line with space, uh, our space uh, policy uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, boosting uh, European uh, innovation and European uh, companies. Uh, you have to realize that uh, it was not uh, easy at the beginning because it's is an intergovernmental uh, body with its own procurement rules, which are not quite the same, uh, even though they were uh, we, we were pushing to have a kind of synergy and uh, avoid any compatibility between uh, the two were different from the rules of uh, procurement, uh, which are valid uh, in the uh, Just an example, for instance, the Court of Justice was not, uh, would not have been seized to a problem uh, of, with ESA uh, on, on the procurement, because uh, ESA benefited uh, due to the convention to uh, the clause of the exemption of jurisdiction. Um, so we put in place the a procurement board that uh, ESA accepted. This means that uh, ESA was procuring according its own rule and according to its own uh, designs, following our requests. But for each procurement, they were, sub they were submitting uh, a, a dossier, a file, to a newly established procurement board. And um, uh, the procurement board, uh, we're given, we're giving the green light or uh, the, the red light for ESA to go. This means that we were in a position ex ante to determine whether or not a procurement proposed by ESA wa was uh, suiting us and suiting our goals. So it was uh, for the space asset, but also uh, don't go to the next slide. That's what's for the uh, space assets, the data asset, for the contributing mission, but also to uh, for the for, for the launch uh, service. That means to 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 buy uh, to buy to buy the rocket. Uh, uh, just one point: this procurement board was uh, typical from Copernicus. Because in Galileo, that was the commission itself who was doing the procurement. And that created a lot of friction with ESA. And in the new regulation, which uh, is going to be adopted next week, I think, or the week after, by the European Parliament, this uh, um, solution of procurement board has been extended to both programs. So, from that point of view, we have been a precursor because we have put in place a genuine and very specific. Uh, uh, procedure in order to, to try to reconcile the benefits of the ESA procurement rules with the fact that the Commission could say yes or no and ensure that the procurement is done, is done according to our uh, fundamental um, criteria. With the MEDSAT, now uh, the delegation agreement follows the same rule. It's rather less complicated uh, because uh, there are um, basically uh, two uh, or uh, three satellites which uh, are uh, for one part uh, meteorological satellites and for another part uh, Sentinel for Copernicus on the same platform. The interesting thing with EMETSAT is that uh, EMETSAT, so it's the um, European uh, uh, Organization for the Meteorology 
קל סטלייט. באמת קצת, אז לא of agreement with in particular the USA, with NOAA and NASA. And for us that has been a plus because for instance something like this Six has been uh, built and launched uh, with the help of uh, uh, and with the contribution in kind of uh, uh, NASA. If I remember well, we, were, we have been building the satellite and the American have been uh, providing the launcher. So uh, this means that um, through an international organization like uh, HumanSat, we have been able to continue uh, at a high level, a very beneficial level of uh, coordination and synergy with uh, NOAA, which is the atmosphere, the uh, meteorological system of uh, the meteorological institution of uh, the USA, and with NASA, which is the, the space uh, agency. Next slide. So the other delegated act were for each service to the, what we call that interested entity, that means the entities which are running the services. So you see that uh, atmosphere and climate has been uh, uh, given to the ECMWF, which is a quite a longer acronym. It stands for uh, European Center for um, Medium uh, Weather Forecast. That means, um, for instance, uh, they are doing the, the forecast for uh, meteorological event up to two, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Uh, that's particularly important, for instance, to determine where a cyclone or a typhoon will go, uh, depending on where it starts and depending on all the conditions around. Uh, for the uh, service on the on the land uh, that has been given for the global land that means non-European land to the GRC, the, which is uh, the Joint Research Center, a service of the Commission, and for uh, the land for Europe, which is much more precise and which is uh, supporting now mostly a lot of. Uh, on a, uh, DG, uh, starting by the environment DG, but also the, the agriculture, agriculture DG, has been given to the European Environment uh, Agency. And uh, marine has been given to a private, semi private uh, entities, which is Mercator, uh, Mercator Ocean, uh, which is based in, in, in Toulouse. And uh, why? Because it was the one who uh, developed during the research and development phase of, Co of the services of Copernicus, the My Ocean, that was called My Ocean, the prototype uh, on which the marine service has been built. So we played the continuity. And finally, for the security service, that Frontex, that everybody knows, EMSA, the Maritime Surveillance um, uh, Safety Authority, and the, uh, for the support of the external action of the, uh, the EU diplomacy, uh, the European Satellite Center, which is in, in Madrid. Uh, just to give you a to give you a, a flavor, I told you that uh, at the beginning we were uh, having. Uh, 3.4 billions for the seven years of the Copernicus in the MFS, which is now ending. Uh, out of that, 3.1 uh, billion only went to ESA for the development of the satellite and uh, the purchase of the, of, of the, of the launcher. Uh, this means that, of course, you, you will see that uh, the services uh, were costing something like uh, between six and uh, uh, yes, six and six hundred fifty uh, million. 
um, for the um, uh, emergency uh, service, uh, we don't have, uh, because it's a service of the commission, we don't have a delegation agreement, but we have a kind of um, uh, memorandum of uh, understanding, which is a kind of delegation agreement, but uh, as a service of the commission, of course, it's much more easy because uh, belonging to the same institution, we can uh, adjust uh, the legal link between us and the GRC uh, in a very flexible uh, manner. Um, from the international point of view, that's the service which is the most uh, um, visible and uh, which uh, exporting itself a lot because um, it um, provides uh, early warning and monitoring for flood, uh, fire, and uh, uh, droughts, but also in case of uh, dramatic uh, um, climatic uh, event, uh, for instance, after a tsunami or after a volcano kind of eruption or after a cyclone, it uh, gives uh, rapid mapping. And uh, of the uh, of the uh, countries uh, affected, and also uh, indicate through uh, different maps um, uh, the, the risk and the uh, the way to to help uh, recovery. And uh, you will understand that now in opposition of uh, indigenous pad GDEFCO, it's very important. It's very important because we have a lot of country which has uh, been faced with um, this kind of event, and we plan to uh, open a kind of uh, mirror site of uh, the emergency management service in, in in Panama to take care of the Caribbean region, to take care of. Uh, uh, all the events uh, arriving in the Gulf of Mexico, but also in Latin America. Uh, why Panama? Because Panama has been already uh, chosen by the UN and to put their uh, humanitarian uh, civil protection hub, and also because uh, it's, a, it's a country uh, where uh, the connectivity and uh, the position, the geographical position, put uh, put we put this um, uh, mirror site right in the middle of uh, the possible event. Um, that was also the first time that, uh, because of the emergency service, that the EU uh, entered the charter, the international charter for a major disaster, which is uh, uh, a text of international uh, law, which foresee that all the different uh, Earth Observation Service around the, uh, the Earth, in case of uh, a major uh, event somewhere, are diverting their satellites and uh, their acquisition uh, to the spot where the event has uh, occurred in order to provide uh, rapid uh, information. That's very important because that was the first time that uh, the EU went uh, into this, uh, this charter and that has enhanced uh, considerably the efficiency of the, of, of the chart. Uh, why that? Uh, why this charter? Because we're never sure, of course, that uh, one satellite is flying over uh, a place where uh, an event is occurring. That's why we and to follow due to the to the duration of the, the orbiting around the, the the Earth of the different uh, of the different uh, satellites uh, through the charter, we are more or less sure. That we we have satellites um, every hour or so uh, spotting the uh, uh, the place where the event took place. 
I was uh, telling you that it's a it's a user driven approach because uh, we remember that in the governance uh, slide uh, we have a user forum, but also we are uh, uh, systematically um, uh, in contact with uh, uh, public user, but also with uh, new users. And as uh, they use Copernicus, more and more needs uh, are revealed. And uh, this uh, is extremely important because that will condition the future of Copernicus, that will condition the design of the new satellites, and that will condition also how the different services will work to uh, produce the information and, and, and product. So at the end of the day, the users are those which will be uh, determining uh, which kind of modification should uh, be done uh, in the space infrastructure for the future and uh, the institute infrastructure as well, but also uh, what uh, the different services should add in their uh, products uh, catalog uh, and which kind of uh, new information they should uh, uh, look, uh, look at. That means that uh, um, both uh, the private users and the uh, private uh, or commercial users and the, the public uh, users uh, are, uh, to my mind, uh, those who are uh, ultimately shaping uh, the not only the structure the future the future structure of the space component but also what the copernicus will become in in the year to come next slide i was uh, i was telling you that um, is uh, user driven and uh, it's also very important for policy makers. Uh, currently, uh, I think something like 19 DGs in the commission are using uh, on a daily basis or quite often uh, EU observation data to, to drive, to modify, to complement their policy. Amongst those, uh, DG Inpa and DG uh, X DG Disco, because um, uh, we are in charge for developing countries, uh, for low income or medium income countries, to help them to to meet the the, the development goal, sustainable development goals, and. Uh, we found that Copernicus is directly relevant to eight of those, and indirectly up to 17. Um, I, can, I can give you example for, for, for hours, um, but it's very simple. You, know? you cannot uh, monitor something you don't know. And uh, the SDGs mostly is the monitoring of the environment, the monitoring of the people, the monitoring of um, uh, the cities, the monitoring of the expansion of uh, networks, uh, and in all that, Copernicus is the most uh, precise and affordable uh, provider of uh, of uh, data uh, on the top of that uh, the data are absolutely uh, i would not say given all situation in quasi real time but it's not a snapshot and then you wait for two two years to have the 
uh, an evaluation of the situation. Uh, the data could be modified in a linear based basis. Uh, of course, that it's very important for security. That is very important to uh, see all the different uh, uh, problem of the of navigation at sea, uh, the development of city. You know, uh, for instance, the uh, the point on cities is one of the main, uh, the most difficult in the uh, in the. Development goals because uh, uh, in the world a lot of the cities does not uh, does not uh, have uh, any tools to to uh, to uh, follow the development of the city uh, and to uh, to know exactly where uh, the cities could be uh, could be uh, expand uh, in uh, safely and where it could be. Uh, uh, submitted to uh, to uh, some certain uh, uh, issues, not to say danger. On the top of that, a lot of countries have not a single land register, and uh, if they want to monitor what is happening, obviously they need to do that through uh, remote sensing to, and then through Copernicus. Uh, water management is also an excellent example. Uh, there are a lot of uh, issues, in, in particular in Latin America, and Copenhagen again uh, is uh, uh, of uh, utmost importance. I could also uh, uh, quote the problem of um, the, the basin of the big uh, rivers: Amazon, Congo, Senegal, uh, Ramaput, uh, and so on and so forth. And if you want to uh, add, uh, if you want to get uh, an evaluation of uh, the current situation, the deforestation, the uh, modification of uh, of the river uh, itself, plus uh, the forecast uh, in case of uh, drastic climate change in this region, you need to define. Uh, Sustainable policy, and for that you need also to have this data. So for us, it's a very, very important tool. Uh, both I, I quote Canada, uh, sorry Panama, but we have a lot of other countries which are interested. For instance, Chile or Philippines or Indonesia. So that's uh, my uh, favorite tree. Uh, from uh, data and uh, uh, product to end users, we have developed a new ecosystem, which is uh, mostly ecosystem done by private sector and uh, which can uh, boost growth, provide jobs, and uh, finally be beneficial for uh, a lot of, of the society. Um, just before the down, between the downstream and the user uptake, you see all the different uh, Copernicus uh, initiatives. None of them were foreseen in the uh, regulation, the basic regulation, and they have been blossoming. And we have structured them in such a way that we give more visibility and more efficiency of. Uh, the Copernicus program in, in order to, to boost this uh, environment. Next slide, for instance, you have, we have put in place a couple of initiatives. Uh, you, you have here uh, uh, the main um, academy, that in a global network, uh, bringing university and research institution uh, using uh, Copernicus where they could exchange best practice, discovery, innovation, and so on and so forth. Relays, where we, have, uh, we are doing our outreach activities, both at regional level, but also uh, local and national. Uh, we have developed info session uh, in all uh, over the EU to raise awareness on Copernicus, and in particular targeting uh, the small and medium enterprises. And then we have uh, 
put in place for uh, specific uh, for Copernicus, but not for for the for the, the dynamic of the new uh, uh, technologies, because all of them are, are using the same uh, patterns. We have put in place masters, Copernicus masters, where in order to have a kind of competition to uh, in order to showcase the benefits of Copernicus service in uh, everyday uh, life. Uh, a program of uh, incubation of uh, new uh, small undertaking uh, in order to pay uh, 20 uh, European startups every year to finance their incubation where, where, where they where they want and in, in order to allow them to uh, to grow and uh, to uh, at the end of the day being one of those beneficiary from the, the ecosystem the accelerator is that we we offer through a, a new a new program uh, to uh, 50 uh, best or boldest uh, innovators and uh, to uh, have access to all the different services in order to to coach them to uh, to progress and to 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 go from the the point of uh, uh, i mean startup to uh, uh, more established uh, company and then the hackathon but uh, everybody knows that's the hackathon that means that to develop uh, and that's also one of the characteristic of Copernicus, we have the um, induced um, algorithm factories everywhere. And the hackathon is for, to, for uh, giving the possibility to developers, entrepreneurs, and so on and so forth, to base, to develop a new, uh, new, new application. Uh, finally, the skills, because uh, this new technology, data, big data, because Copernicus, uh, as I told you at the beginning, has been an enabler of the switch to to, to big data in, in Europe, uh, both in terms of uh, um, uh, clouds, but also in terms of um, of new uh, algorithm production, um, uh, production of new new, new algorithm. Uh, we we have decided to, uh, but to do that, uh, you need skilled uh, people, and then we have decided to also uh, push. Uh, through a program of training and education uh, and courses, the possibility for people to to get uh, to get involved in uh, in the development of uh, of this new uh, uh, technology, with a link of other existing program, which is, uh, for instance, Erasmus Plus or uh, Horizon. Next slide. So, uh, Copernicus data policy, full, free, open. Uh, that is very important. Uh, I stress one again that we were the first to not only give access to all information and product generated by the system, but also to the raw data, enabling anybody to reprocess the basic data in order to match certain needs, which were not taken on board by the Copernicus program. So it's a kind of uh, uh, you know, open source software. It's, uh, even though it's not a software, but it's, it's an open source uh, of, of data where you can, out of the data, uh, re, um, through reprocessing, achieve certain things that the Copernicus service will never deliver. Um, actually, that was an idea which came from uh, also space, but from a totally different uh, horizon. Uh, if uh, for those of you a fund of astronomy. Um, the major discovery 
I think, I, I think 60% of the discovery after the data uh, uh, that the, the NASA published from the telescope uh, above has been done by uh, outside NASA and outside uh, the big university, which were at the source of the Hubble project. Just because they were they have released openly the core data and the raw data, and people have been reprocessed the data and sometimes achieved discovery that we were not, uh, uh, we, we, we were, which uh, were not uh, found by the, the different services in charge of the, 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 the processing of the Apple data. For Copernicus, it's a, it, it's a bit the same thing. So you, you acquire systematically all the data because the satellites are acquiring uh, not a certain, so according to a certain time and on certain region, they are acquiring data all over the world through each orbit and all the data are stored and they are then uh, made public. This means that you have through data mining the possibility to find whatever you want uh, on whatever uh, place uh, on uh, on. Of course, the problem was uh, how to get this data and how to reprocess them, because uh, that was a um, certain time uh, quite uh, expensive and difficult, even for the services to uh, process the data, because you need huge uh, computer. And of course, if you are a startup, you don't have access to uh, high level, high grade uh, computer. So we decided to to launch uh, uh, another uh, side of the Copernicus program, which were completely ignored at the beginning. It's the access data scheme through the DIAS. DIAS is the uh, data uh, information and information access system. Through a procurement, we selected five consortia, which not only were due to give access uh, to uh, the archive and the data storage uh, to uh, everybody, provided you subscribe to this program, but also where, and that free of charge, but uh, because they need to, to, to have commercial benefits in order to, to, to run this platform, they were renting possibility of computing. So you don't need anymore, if you have access to this platform, to have a computer at, at home, because the same platform are giving you access to the data and are allowing, allowing you either to use algorithm already existing or to download your own algorithm on their own computers, and then you use for a certain period of time the computers of the platform. There are five. They have been uh, launched in 2018. They are competing, and uh, we will see at the end of the day which one will uh, will uh, will remain or will uh, uh, take a lead in certain. Uh, sector because there are already certain specifications amongst the three uh, the three platforms but uh, it's um, obviously a very useful tool because not only you get access to data but you get access to computing resources next slide so i've already talked about that the economic uh, uh, benefit uh, if we take what has been uh, what has been uh, uh, put on the program since 2008 till 2020, uh, it's nearly uh, 8.2 billion, and that has uh, generated uh, we no that has generated 12 billion. 
there is a problem with the slides. Yes, 11.5 billion. Um, next slide, because I've already. Uh, So the uh, international strategy of Copernicus is um, uh, where the administrative agreements that I uh, alluded to before enter uh, into play. Uh, a lot of countries uh, were uh, predominantly uh, interested uh, by Earth observation data at the time uh, given by uh, the US, uh, sometimes by China. Uh, and of course, they were, uh, as Copernicus was developing, more and more uh, interested in uh, adding to uh, the data from, from the US, the European data. So, uh, not, not only uh, Data, but, but also information and product that in process process data. Uh, so we have we have uh, uh, developed uh, a policy to uh, find international uh, partners to sell Copernicus, and uh, we have uh, agreement signed with certain countries: USA, Australia, India, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, the whole African Union, Serbia, and Ukraine, uh, which allow uh, directly a hub to hub connection. This means that uh, they can enter directly our uh, archive center and uh, all the different um, data uh, storage facility in Europe in order to do their data mining and to have the possibility to use them the way they want. Uh, we are in ongoing discussion, I told you, with Panama uh, and the Philippines. That's very important because that differentiates, uh, this is the map in red of the country where we have the, the, uh, the agreement. Uh, the force of, uh, again, uh, I repeat myself, uh, the force of Copernicus is that the data are free and that we are, uh, we are we offer the possibility to access the, the, raw, the raw data and not, for instance, to send a, a picture of uh, your country in order to, uh, to show the, the drought or the fire, but also all the data before and after and the data which I've been using for, for, for the picture. So that uh, from data, in order to delineate uh, the area which has been burning, you can also do hydrology, you can do uh, you can do sometimes uh, land uh, register, uh, uh, land registry, and so on. Next slide. So, uh, to, 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 to sum up, the data uh, dissemination means uh, we have the uh, both hand of the of the of the slide, uh, things I've already uh, alluded to the up to up connections with the country with which we have an agreement, and uh, the partnership with the uh, DIAS, where we can have access to the data plus to have access to uh, the computing uh, facility. Obviously, in the last case. Uh, there are sometimes a problem of connectivity because um, uh, if uh, and that's a big advantage of the hub to hub connection, so, uh, if you are linked uh, through internet through the uh, DIAS, you cannot expect to have the, uh, a quick way to process your data. Uh, hence, that's why in DG uh, in Pana, we are uh, having a discussion in order to uh, enhance and to uh, gradually uh, improve the connectivity between uh, Europe and uh, Latin America and uh, Asia. Uh, by the way, uh, the Council has just uh, adopted uh, a common uh, position on political position on European gateway 
which is exactly uh, in the same vein, which means to, uh, to try to, to have our own uh, connectivity network around the world and to counterbalance a bit uh, the GAFA, we are not yet there, uh, and the uh, Chinese. Uh, there are two additional ways. No, not yet. Previous one. There are two additional ways to have that, uh, to have the, uh, to, to obtain certain data of uh, Copernicus. Uh, a system which has been developing by uh, the MedSat, which has, which is a MedCast in Africa, but it's only push data. That means that every day, that was based on, that was originally developed for the meteorological data. That means they push and through a simple way and through satellites uh, every day, all the data they have for the Africa continent on meteorology. They can do the same things for certain Copernicus data and they are doing uh, mainly South Africa three and uh, something that will five and uh, six in the future. And uh, uh, another uh, achievement, uh, which is uh, linked to the connectivity, is that, for instance, we are paying, we have paid uh, the first uh, transatlantic, a part of the first transatlantic cable going directly from Europe to uh, uh, South America, it starts in Lisbon and uh, land on in Fortaleza in, in, in Brazil. And uh, we have paid also within Latin America the kind of buckle of uh, high capacity optical cable, uh, which is called the Red Clara, which um, regroup more or less all the countries uh, of uh, South America. So that for in the future, the, the cable is uh, is uh, about to be uh, functional now. In the weeks or year or months to come, that started in, I think it's in 2016 or 2017. Uh, it has been quite long to not to lay in, uh, in uh, on the in, the in the ocean, but to to put together all the different uh, companies and interests because uh, this cable will be both commercial and to be the commission is the owner of the pair of fibers uh, for the public use. Next slide. Obviously, I, I had to take uh, account of the current situation and uh, one development which obviously was not foreseen at the beginning it's uh, Copernicus uh, and health and in particular in the uh, fight against the, uh, the coronavirus of course uh, it's not the vaccine uh, so the it's um, more about assessing the uh, the migration assessing uh, and spotting where the health facility uh, for covid should be uh, created uh, monitoring the impact of the covid crisis in navigation and also terrestrial border uh, with the closure of terrestrial border uh, assessing also the environmental effect of the crisis and uh, uh, hopefully to be one of uh, the as digitalization and data seems to be one of the more sustainable way to boost recovery to see how Copernicus through the different implementation and I refer to the graph of the SDGs could help this recovery. Next slide. So uh, that was during my uh, uh, tenure. Uh, 
from uh, 2013 to 2019. Now there is a new space regulation which uh, will replace, at, uh, in fact, in one single text, the three legal bases which were existing. Uh, Galileo, Copernicus, and their own regulations. And we had another regulation for uh, the uh, tracking, uh, space tracking system, tracking of satellites and debris. Now everything is one is in one regulation, and uh, we have had uh, a rationalization of the different uh, procedures governing the different programs. Uh, one example I gave you already that the uh, advantage of the procurement board has been extended to the uh, new. Um, that will also provide a certain economy of scale because this program established a new agency, the new uh, the European Union Agency for space uh, uh, for the, all the space program, which will uh, do the uptake of the different programs. While before the uptake of Copernicus, the uptake of uh, of um, Galileo. Uh, were done uh, uh, in a different way and by different people, so that will be entrusted to, to the agency, as well as uh, the you know, integrated management, data management system, which were not harmonized. Uh, the budget uh, for Copernicus uh, has been increased because new mission, that means new satellites, and not just the replacement of the current one uh, are foreseen. In particular, uh, for monitoring the CO2, and uh, also maybe for monitoring the Arctic. And um, it has been the budget has been increased to uh, more or less. Uh, 5.2 uh, billion. And again, a large part will go to the infrastructure, which is replacing the current satellites, or not replacing, but uh, uh, launching recurrent, new recurrent for the existing satellites and uh, developing new missions. And 1.5 billion will go to develop the different uh, services. But in a nutshell, uh, also there are important provisions against uh, cyber security, which was uh, for us, uh, and in particular for Galileo, uh, always a, a, a challenge. But the main uh, points I've described vis-à-vis -vis the structure and the governance of Copernicus will not be affected by this uh, regulation, or will be. Uh, uh, not only affected, but uh, will be prolonged. Next slide, I think I come to the end. Thank you. Thank you. So here, I've been talking quite uh, for quite a long time, one, one hour and a half. So up to you for questions. Yes, thank you very much. It was a very informative and very insightful lecture. Uh, we have some questions uh, um, regarding what you mentioned. Um, in your slides, you mentioned that Copernicus indirectly supports all the 17 SDGs. Is there any type of uh, uh, formal or informal agreement uh, between the EU and the UN on the SDGs? And then Maybe we can go one by one and then uh, rather than collect all the questions because they are quite um, different among each other. Now, there are, we are following, we have one directorate in DG Impa, 
which are following the SDGs. And uh, of course, uh, there is no agreement, but there are collaboration, not only with the, uh, mostly with some UN agencies, uh, UN agencies. Uh, and uh, the SDGs, uh, it's not only covering uh, address to, 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 to the EU, but also to, uh, to, to the member state of the EU. So the, the main uh, point uh, to answer your, your question, very, I mean, the agreement itself is the agreement on uh, SDG. Then we have a kind of collaboration with the UN in order to, uh, to, to, to see where the problem of reaching the SDGs in the allocated time uh, are problematic or not. And uh, we are, of course, doing the programming, which is currently uh, going on in DG INPA. This means the programming of um, uh, which will frame the, the partnership between uh, the EU, uh, its member states, and each of the of, of the country, the low income and medium income country, for the next uh, seven years. During this programming, we are taking. Uh, uh, of course, due consideration of the difficulties that some uh, of these countries could uh, could face to attain the, the sustainable development goal. Okay, we then have another question. Um, in the new regulation, uh, when detailing uh, the role of the new ELSPA, uh, which will also undertake uh, uh, market uptake and will undertake communication, promotion and market development activities of data and services offered by Copernicus, uh, um, the audience would like to know how this will be implemented in practice in order to avoid any overlap between different EU institutional actors and whether some uh, scheme or um, internal agreements have already been put in place. I don't know if I'm getting the the, the gist of the of, of, of the question. Um, uh, the I EU think, spa, yeah. Yes, I think they refer to the fact that uh, with the new regulation uh, and the um, description of the activities of the new uh, EU Agency for the Space Programme, uh, in Article 30 is mentioned uh, that um, the agency will also uh, undertake uh, uh, the communication, uh, promotion and so on, and market development of the services offered by Copernicus, which is a, an enlargement, I would say, of its competencies. And uh, um, so the question, I think it relates to how this will be implemented in practice. So whether there will be an overlap with the current uh, governance, institutional governance or not. No, and there is not be a, that. no, that will not be an overlap because the new AU space agency will be, uh, will report to the commission. That means that all those, some, for instance, uptake activities and outreach activities that we were uh, carrying uh, with uh, less um, means and uh, few people in the Commission will be transferred under the control of the Commission to the new EU SPA uh, in order for them with uh, much more uh, money and much more uh, staff to carry what the Commission was doing, to carry out what the Commission was doing before. But that there will not be an, an overlap. We are we are subsidiary the certain task. We are given giving certain tasks to EU SPA under the control of the Commission. Delegation. Okay, and then uh, we have another question. Um, Copernicus uh, uh, is uh, a bit the best example of how in the European Union the space policy could serve as a sort of multi-purpose uh, policy. Uh, which means that it could contribute to the progress in a lot of other uh, EU policies. And it is true that it has been particularly true so far, uh, especially for Copernicus and Galileo to some extent. Do you see the same happening with other uh, EU initiatives and uh, namely with the SST uh, initiative and especially from the fact that we switched from an initial support framework um, with support given, given by the Commission to uh, what is recalled in the new regulation, the flagship program of the Union. 
I think that we have to differentiate uh, that uh, there are space uh, programs and space programs. Okay. Uh, Galileo and uh, Galileo and uh, Copernicus. Uh, they are space programs, but also industrial programs in order to boost innovation and to support certain parts of the space industry. In particular, by the way, the satellite industry uh, and the, the launcher industry. You can understand that uh, because we are launching quite a lot of satellites, we are paying quite a lot to the uh, launcher industry and uh, the launcher industry is facing huge competition with SpaceX in particular. So that means that the public, uh, pub as a public customer, we are supporting uh, Ariane 5, 6, Vega, and the European uh, launcher in order to ensure that we have uh, autonomous access to space. Uh, likewise, likewise for satellites, uh, apart, uh, you know, with the development of, um, of uh, the, the cable, the telecommunication satellites are less and less useful. Okay, now they try to find a second use with uh, five, uh, 5G and uh, internet, but it's not quite the same satellites. Yeah, that will not be uh, the big geostationary satellites, but that will be, uh, you know, a lot of micro satellites in rather low orbits. Uh, with a lifespan very, very short. So the traditional satellite industry needs to have commands in order to orders to have uh, to, uh, to survive. And that's why uh, it's also an industrial program. For SST, it's completely different. SST is to try to have a kind of autonomy for surveillance and tracking in Europe and not to depend on the information received from the USA. Because the information received from the USA, basically, they, they are filtered, or they might be filtered. Because when you look at the sky, you see things, you see debris, you see civil satellites, but you see also other uh, satellites for which the American does not want to make any publicity. So the data of the SST, currently in Europe are relying mainly on uh, the US one. And we know that the US one, you know, uh, are using a kind of, uh, uh, are themselves a gatekeeper, you know, uh, they are filtering the information and we never know that it's accurate. On. So SST has been developed to uh, try but that will be a long way, to have an autonomy for the surveillance of space. The problem is that we will not launch satellites for that because it's, uh, it's uh, ground uh, infrastructure which ensure the, the SST. And the problem that my successors will be facing <laughs> in DGDFIS is that in most of the country, all the terrestrial infrastructure of SSD are in the hands of the military. So two thirds of the information will not be shared. For the same reason uh, as the Americans are doing their control, uh, their, their gate control, uh, not to, uh, to spread around information which are classified. So, SST is more a uh, new kind of coordination where the Commission will put in place a system but will enable the system to work, but the information in the system will be still under the sole control of the member states. And basically, the only infrastructure we may pay is a telescope or radars uh, in. Uh, uh, on Earth. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, where do you see the best possibilities of using Copernicus for uh, local and regional authorities 
and what are the EU Commission's plan to support the Copernicus uptake as much as possible by those local and regional authorities? Well, there are already uh, there are already uh, some uh, associations uh, from local authorities mm -hmm. um, uh, which are using uh, Copernicus and. Uh, these local authorities are part of uh, the user forum. Uh, of course, that depends very much on uh, what the local authorities are uh, aiming to. Okay, but uh, for uh, infrastructure, for instance, bridges, uh, roads, uh, uh, any kind of uh, you know, any kind of uh, network, energy network. Uh, the local authorities, in order to plan those infrastructure, need to have um, data from uh, from Copernicus, not only to design the project, but also to see the development. The big example I have is, for instance, the, when the bridge has been uh, built between Denmark and Sweden. Okay, uh, the assessment of um, in the different uh, months of the year, the assessment of the marine currents, you know, and uh, have, uh, have led to a redesign, a partial redesign of the bridge in order to, to avoid uh, to, be, uh, to, uh, to be built of, of, uh, in, in front of this current. Uh, it goes the same way, for instance, with high tension uh, uh, electrical grid where uh, Copernicus, due to the combination of ter terrestrial uh, data plus uh, climate, uh, sorry, uh, atmosphere data and meteorology, helping, for instance, in, mon in mountains or in very uh, remote area to design the best, uh, the best way. But uh, it's also up to the governments of the EU. And in certain uh, governments, for instance, in certain countries, like for instance in Spain or in Italy, uh, the promotion uh, of Copernicus possibility uh, in the regional, uh, not to mention uh, Germany, because um, as a federal state, they have directly uh, representative uh, in the Copernicus uh, in the Copernicus committee. But uh, for those like Italy and, and, and Spain. The government has been pushing and has been helping us to develop uh, outreach activities and to uh, ensure that local authorities are aware of the different possibilities. By the way, Copernicus is a EU. You will say that you, you have understood that uh, it's an EU program. It's not belonging to the Commission. It's belonging to Europe. And through ESA, it's belonging to Europe and the member states. It's not because the Commission has the 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 duty to run the program that we are the, the only. Okay, we have the last question, uh, and it is about uh, uh, Copernicus uh, uh, data policy. Um, in uh, uh, recent times, Copernicus has also been the target of uh, criticism uh, with regard to um, data policy, saying that uh, the program in the end indirectly. Um, uh, is, uh, support uh, Google and Amazon, which are inappropriately commercializing and profiting from uh, such uh, Copernicus data policy, open data policy. Uh, others argued also that this policy should be limited to European users in order to preserve the benefits of the programs for uh, exactly for European citizens and member states, as you rightly mentioned now because uh, the program has been supported to um, also taxpayers' money. Um, in recent times, also the new European Commission at the beginning of its term declared that it wanted to catch up with the US uh, big tech uh, giants and to foster a competitive and uh, fair European single digital market, which could also translate on the ways, on possible ways uh, to modify the current Copernicus approach. Uh, can you already give an hint on how this might happen in practice? 
You know, uh, since the American has now given the Earth observation data full free uh, to the entire world, if we are not doing the same, we are going the, the wrong way and, we'll be, and we will be completely sidelined. Okay. Uh, why it's very important and why the economic uh, reason is uh, completely biased is that most currently, you, you quote Amazon and, uh, or Google, whatever. Uh, uh, first of all, I think that uh, in uh, all the member states, a lot of programs, national programs, you know, uh, are run by uh, Google and Amazon with the taxpayer money of those, uh, of those countries. Uh, all the applications, in particular Stop COVID and all the, uh, the, the others, are run by American company. Okay, first point. Second point, as regards the open and free policy, you, it's in itself a way to, uh, to, uh, to make Copernicus famous, palatable, and people want to have the data. Currently, most of the data, as most of the dias, the dias that I have uh, presented before, are European. And there is a lot, there is a lot of uh, third countries which have not the possibility to process the data and which have uh, by, uh, I mean, by contract, European companies processing the data for them in order to uh, have the benefits of Copernicus. Uh, if, uh, uh, and, and lastly, I don't know how to, <laughs> you know, in the globalized world, uh, to restrict Copernicus of, uh, 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 in Europe, my only question is how you how you do it. How you do it because uh, if you have uh, in Europe, uh, I mean, uh, a branch of uh, of a Chinese company or Chilean company, uh, even located in Europe, you have to avoid this this in Europe to access the site of Copernicus. How, how, how can you do this? You can you you can you cannot. You just cannot. Course. Okay, we don't have any further questions and also um, our time for this webinar is over. Um, before uh, finishing, just let me remind you that all the webinars have been recorded and they will be uploaded on our YouTube channel uh, plus on our website. For all the future events, please check our spacegovernance.eu uh, website, which is our Jean Monnet Center of Excellence um, new website. Tomorrow we will have another lecture by Dr. Henry, Professor Henry Hertzfeld, which is the director of the Space Policy Institute uh, for the George Washington University. Um, and if you have any further questions, if you want to have access to the slides or um, any other information we shared during this lecture series, please uh, write at um, our email. Uh, we thank you very much again for this very, very informative lecture. Uh, it doesn't happen so often to um, hear a lecture about Copernicus. Usually it's uh, Galileo, our main uh, uh, focus uh, also in, uh, in academic writing. Uh, so thank you very much for this very, very insightful lecture. It was a pleasure. And, uh, we see you uh, at the next webinars. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you again.